Speaking of Courage Podcast, we are back in your life. What's going on, Chase? Back again. Not much, man. Back again. Two week intervals. We're staying with it, right? Trying to, yeah. Trying to. See if we can be consistent again. Yeah, yeah. How's your week going, man? Pretty good, man. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Just a bit hot, but, you know. Fourth of July is coming? Yep, yep. You happy about that? Is that like one of your favorite holidays? Uh, honestly, no, not necessarily. No? I love yeah. it. I mean, I like the idea of it, but it's just so hot. You yeah, know? <laughs> it always uh, is a I, li- I like Memorial Day and Veterans Day. And yeah, Christmas and you know, yeah, all that good so stuff. So, where are we headed today? Uh, what do you think? Vietnam. All yeah, right, there we go. I'm getting pretty all right, good at there this. There you go. You're on it, man. <laughs> See, you're better than yeah. 75 percent of the population. <laughs> I'd imagine. I don't know about that, bro. As far as that goes. Yeah, yeah. All right, so yeah, we're doing Vietnam cool again. Helmet. Yep. So you might maybe you notice, maybe not. This is actually the Marine Corps Vietnam. We haven't done Marine oh, okay. Corps yet in Vietnam. So the vest is going to be a little bit different. The flag. All the stuff on this helmet is authentic. Yeah. The tape and everything. Yeah. So this is um, the army. If you'll notice, they'll have like a, a, a cat's eye or not a cat's eye. They didn't have cat's eye in Vietnam, but they have the helmet cover. The yeah. Band. The Marines would use like a rubber tire a tread, so they're like bicycle tires and things oh, like that. Oh, that's kind of cool. Just to keep it on? Yeah, occasionally they would have um, the, um, man, I'm losing it right now, the, the elastic band like the Army would, but generally if you see that, it's going to be Marine Corps, and if you see this plated type vest, it's going to be Marine These Corps. These are plates that go in Yeah, here? they're like little plastic plates. They're not plastic, but they're the, they're the plates. The Army has the uh, more um, the uh, Kevlar mesh yeah. type. Style. And so this is the stuff that they would stick playing cards and stuff yeah. in? Yeah, that's usually more flare. in the movies, but you'll see a bit of that. Yeah. You'll see a lot of graffiti on the camouflage covers. Yeah, because you have some helmets where people drew on them and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, those are awesome. And that was actually done in... The yeah, jungle somewhere. You'll see a ton of pictures of those. Yeah, and yeah, I, have, cool. I have some cool ones at home. They're they're faked a lot, but one of the things to think about when you see the movies and they have all the playing cards and stuff, if you're in the hot, humid jungle and you're walking through the trees, how long is a paper playing card yeah, going to yeah. last? How long are that's those? True. So a lot of that stuff's not. You so know, like worn out graffiti stuff is the more likely legit. real. Yeah, and it's it's sometimes it's hard, but usually you can kind of tell tell the difference. That's on awesome. Whether or not it's real. So, so Vietnam, this is a we're basic headed. setup. Yeah, this is a, and he's got the M14 uh, rifle mags rather than the. Uh, M16 or... Uh, so they the, use different weaponry. The Marines favor the M14 a bit more than the Army did, um, but both both early on they used the M14 and then they transitioned to the M16 style. Okay. So, yeah, you'll... If you see a picture of a Vietnam and you know what you're looking for, you can tell right away if it's Army or Marines or Navy or whatever. You're okay. Gonna so this vest you're going to see. If you've ever seen Full Metal Jacket, yep. they're wearing Army vest, the, the three-quarter collar vest, which is wrong. So somebody... How did they miss like, that? Because it's cheaper to buy the army one. Oh, okay. So they, no, the Hollywood doesn't care what they. Yeah, do. they're not it's, worried it's about Kubrick. it. Kubrick. They filmed it in England, so you oh, know, okay. They, they used what they had. Does that stuff irk you? Not too bad. No. Yeah, a lot. A lot of people they call them, you know, stitch counters or button counters. I can watch a movie for the story, but if the story is ridiculous, it bugs me. But yeah. I, I can overlook certain things. Like the Hurt Locker is the worst movie in the world. I is can't it really? Stand that movie. How come? It's just it, the story makes it has. It's like has no semblance of real military story. Oh, okay. None of that could happen. It's just it's just completely off the wall, so it's stupid. It's Days of Thunder for NASCAR fans, dude. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but if you watch, like, Black Hawk Down, some of their stuff's going to be a little bit inconsistent, but who cares because the story's there and the idea's there. and the, the So you don't mind them so. changing up a story a little bit to... Y- yeah, if you're going to fit a story into, you know, a, something that... Every individual on the battlefield has their own story that could take days to tell, yeah. but you have to compress it all into an hour and a half or two so hours shit's and gotta go. put everybody. So you're going to combine characters and stuff. Cool. So who's, yeah. our, who's our hero of the day? All right, so today, not only are we doing a Marine Vietnam, but we're also doing an officer. This is going to be Second Lieutenant John Bobo, who was a Marine officer. I like his name. A little bit different, right? Yeah. John Bobo, but not, not a guy you're going to make fun of, you know, because yeah. this is uh, going to be the Marine Corps. You think he got any shit for his name? Oh, I'm sure he did, <laughs> yeah. There's worse names to have, but you can't not get Bobo? made fun of with Bobo. Yeah, yeah it's kind of like a, a small teddy bear or a, what's what's Yogi? Oh, that's Boo-Boo. A clown, I would think. Yeah, oh, I yeah. I think Bobo the clown. I was thinking Boo-Boo the bear. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, John Bobo, born in uh, February 14th, 1943 in Niagara Falls, New York. So we're going to be another East Coaster upstate guy, kind of okay. upstate New York. And this is, like we've talked about multiple times, this is going to be, he's actually born during World War II. So this is that boomer generation, yep. that baby boomer, the start of that, these guys that are be growing up. Is his up. dad a soldier? Uh, you know, I don't have a lot of information on his family, so I'm not sure. But it, regardless of whether he was or he wasn't, you're going to be surrounded by uncles and fathers and, and community. You're going to have male figures in your life that were military. So that's, It is so crazy how that generation just paved the way for a whole generation of patriotism. Right, and you can see how one generation leads into the next, yeah. though, right? Because the, 
a generation that grows up and goes off to fight a war is going to have children who are going to look at things very differently yeah. because they didn't fight for it in that same way. And that's kind of what it was, was the Vietnam generation is the children of that, that greatest generation. But so everybody from thing. the World War II, everybody was touched in some way. Oh, right? yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no way around it. And if you're a kid growing up and part of this baby uh, boomer generation like John Bobo and these other guys, again, if you have a paper route, and you, you're going all around the neighborhood, you might have a fighter pilot on your route. Yeah. You might have a guy that was POW. You Especially might have in a our Marine. area. Yeah, exactly. Well, here you're going to have all kinds of pilots. Yeah. And, you know, we have an Air Force town. So you're yeah. going to have guys that were fighting in the Pacific, fighting in Europe, guys that are doing we all We probably had so things. many cool dudes around here. Huh? Well, if you go to, the, go to our cemeteries and, and yeah, read some of the placards and see what's there. Yeah. Man. So he's raised up in New York. Yeah, up in New York. And this is going to be, again, that... that a very different lifestyle than what we're used to, but that's that New York lifestyle. Um, he's the son of Paul Arthur and Jane uh, Horan Bobo. Um, going to school, there's not a whole ton of information on him, but some of the things that I did find is they said he wasn't a standout student or athlete, but he had a lot of heart, which, you know, it's going to come into play with all of these guys, right? Yeah. That's going to be the biggest thing. Tough. Size isn't the most important thing, but your heart is. And he actually was uh, considered small. He tried to join the junior varsity football team when he was a kid. And he was actually turned down for the team because he was too small. So his brother said he immediately went home and started working out because he wanted to guarantee that that would never happen again. So right. as soon as he had to deal with that, he took steps to make sure that that never happened again. So he ended up going to uh, Bishop Duffy High School and then Niagara University, where he graduated in 1965. So this is that early time of Vietnam, right? This yep. is when the Gulf of Tonkin's going. We already have. Special forces in Vietnam, the Marines are landing, but this is still early. People just, are still... Just starting to kick off. Just starting to kick off. There's still going to be support for it, but there's going to be a little bit of confusion. A lot of these guys aren't going to know what's going on with Vietnam. You know, people might never have heard of Vietnam in this, this early time, right? And did we get the rise in, in people wanting to go, or was it not nearly as much as it was back then? It, it wouldn't have been like it was in World War II, yeah. but there are going to be people, again, following John F. Kennedy's you yeah. know, call uh, and ask now what your country for, can do for you, but what you can do for your country. So there are going to be people that are going to be rushing that flag. That speech, man, I wonder how many people directly enlisted because of that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, in th at that time, it wasn't a 24-hour news cycle, and it wasn't, you know, you're constantly bombarded with things and everybody, everybody was around the TV everyone's around the TV and you're watching the president my grandparents that. talk about that that when the president did his address or whatever I mean everybody was like you were at home sitting around the TV paying attention exactly everybody was focused on what was going on yeah it meant more mm -hmm. some of them on black and white TV some yeah. of them on color TV so you're paying attention you actually care what they say and that's the message that's coming across and a lot of these kids again you're hearing that message and you're looking up to your dad who you know again might have fought across Europe with Audie Murphy for all we yeah. know. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's moving and it's inspiring. So like a lot of people, though, while he was in college, he joined the Marine Corps. He joined the Marine Corps Reserve. And the Vietnam War, we always think of all the draftees and people not wanting to fight. So John's going to be a number of those guys who's volunteering. And not only is he volunteering, he's volunteering to join the Marine Corps. If there's going to be action, you're going to be yeah. in it in the Marine Corps. But he's still in school, so he's, uh, while he's in school, he majors in history, so he gets his bachelor's degree in history, and he's going to graduate in um, June of 1965. In December of 1965, he's going to get commissioned as a second lieutenant, so he's going to become an officer. He's going to go to Officer's Candidate Corps, basic school in the Marine, Marine Corps School in Quantico, Virginia. He's going to graduate in May of 1966. So again, still early in the war, but he's kind of set his path into motion. And moving up quick. Yeah, still a young man, but he's going in as an officer. So not only is he volunteering for the military, he's volunteering for the Marine Corps, you know, combat arms. Yeah. And not only that, he's volunteering to be an officer, essentially, to lead men. You know, and these guys are aware of joining the Marines, what that means. Right. And Okay. So this is still, again, early, but I, even my dad, when I was younger, always told me in, in, during the Vietnam era, if you were a Marine, you were either in Vietnam, had been to Vietnam, or you were on your way to Vietnam. You know, whereas the Army and the Air Force, you know, we have obligations in Europe and Asia and Korea and Japan and all Marines these places. Were full Marines, go. you're going to Vietnam. Yeah. You're going to Vietnam. If you join the Marines, you're going to Vietnam. You're now, going to fight. Obviously, there's some exceptions to that, but for the most part, yeah. you know what you're getting into if you join the Marine Corps. And whereas the Army had a large number of draftees, the Marine Corps was predominantly volunteer, right? So you're going to be with other guys that want to fight. You're going to be with those gung ho. So it's a much people. more like inspired group, right? Okay. These are the guys looking for action, and yep. then that's what they're going to get. So again, he was commissioned. I'm sorry, he finished his Marine Corps School Officers Candidate in May of 1966, and in June of 1966, he got orders for Vietnam. So right away, a month you know, later. Yeah, you get what you asked for here. So as a, as him him coming in as an officer, 
he comes in and they say, here's your guys? Or yeah, so he- basically when you, yeah, when you become an officer, and that's one of the things about officers, you're going to be in charge of a platoon, essentially. You're the platoon leader. So you might have 30 to 40 guys. You're the, in charge of that. Now, Where do you meet them? It depends. I mean, if you overseas, if you're going to Vietnam, you might meet them over there. And get uh, in the field, right away. They might already be in the field. If and you're you've back never in led men. Potentially, And then yeah. here's your guys. Exactly. Wow, that's crazy. So a good lieutenant relies on their NCOs, though, because you're going to have your sergeants and your staff sergeants and your first sergeant, platoon sergeants. You're going to let them do their job of running the teams, right? The, the sergeants are going to run the fire teams. The staff sergeants are going to run the squad. Decentralized command. Right. And then you're Boom. over overlooking it. There you go. <laughs> a bad lieutenant is going to come in and try to force his will really quick. Yeah. But a good lieutenant is going to step back, right? Put trust That's where guys. you get a lot of those stereotypes of lieutenants as being idiots and being lost and, you know, not knowing anything and, you know, being these fresh cherry recruits. There's an old joke. The difference between a private first class and a lieutenant is the private's been, private first class has been promoted twice. Yeah. It's basically a private's brand new to the military. In a sense, a lieutenant is too, you know, but what people don't realize is they've gone to all this school and they've gone to all this training. But as far as in command or leadership goes, yeah, you're just thrust into it. And you, again, if you take over a platoon in Vietnam, you might be with guys that have been out in the bush for six months. You might have NCOs they, that have been in the Army for 20 years or the Marine Corps for 20 crazy. years, that's and you a, automatically outrank them what by nature of being What an to be in, man. Right? And lieutenants get a bad reputation yeah, for that. Yeah, you can see why. Going into the Army, I, I had a stereotype of lieutenants, how I thought they were. And fortunately for me, every lieutenant I served with in the Army was awesome. You yeah. know, my platoon, my platoon leader, Lieutenant Dials, was awesome. Lieutenant Morris and some of the other guys, they were badass. Like, they were not... They completely blew the stereotype out of the water, you know. So, tough, courageous you, you guys. Get those type, yeah. Just you think the tip of the spear. Because they're they're having to well, prove it takes, themselves. It takes a special kind of person to not only want to go fight, not only want to go deal with this, but to say, "I'll take charge and I'll lead and I'll be responsible for all yeah. these other guys," you know. And they get a bad rap, but most of them are most of them do a great. And job. all lieutenants come come in that way. Come in what way? As out of the school, straight. Yeah, so you're either going to go again to West Point or Annapolis, or you're going to go to Officers Candidate. So there's school. no way to work your way up through. To you can that? go. Yeah, you can go to OCS, which okay. is where you start enlisted, and then you go green to gold, or you go, okay. you become an officer. And those guys are called Mustangs, and sometimes they're respected a little bit more. Right, right. And it's it's just kind of the nature of the beast. Um, so he ends up being uh, uh, the commander of Second Platoon of uh, India Company, three nine Marines, or or. Uh, 3rd Battalion, 9th Marines, which is part of the 3rd Marine Division. So he's going to be the Flaming Eye or India Company, which is a a weapons platoon. He's going to get thrust into this unit where there's going to be guys, again, that have all this experience. But like we talked about, there's good lieutenants and bad lieutenants. By all accounts, John was a great lieutenant, right? He wasn't a gung-ho officer. He wasn't there to try to get medals because some people are just trying to do their time in the bush to get advancement, to get, you know, I did my combat time, now I can go. He was not in pursuit of a promotion. He wasn't trying to get his guys killed. They said he was quiet, competent, and he cared deeply about his men. One of the guys that served with him later said, we were together in Vietnam for seven months. He was a great guy and a great leader. So he actually gave a shit about his dudes. And that means a lot, right? You can see the guys that don't care about you or some, as horrible as it sounds, they actually think they're better than you because, you know, they went to school and you're just these dumb hillbillies or dumb privates or whatever. But John was one of those guys that actually cared and he tried to keep his guys alive, and he tried to make them survive, nice. right? So where he goes, where the 9th Marines are going to be, they're going to be up near the DMZ. We haven't actually talked about this a ton on the show. A little bit. But, um, yeah, the North Vietnam and South Vietnam are separated. That's, that's the, basically what the war is. We're trying to prevent the North from overrunning the South. So the DMZ is the demilitarized, demilitarized zone. It's the central Vietnam. That's where we, we don't go north of that, right? We are keeping that area... Politically, we're not going to tra- pro- cross over and invade the north. Do they honor that too? Absolutely not. Okay. So that's what the Ho Chi Minh Trail is. They're going around through Cambodia and Laos, and they're sending troops across the DMZ. So these Marines are going to be right up there in a Quang Tri. It's a con- Contain, contain, I don't know how to pronounce it, but they're right south of the DMZ. So this is where all the NVA is going to be coming yeah. through. They can lob mortars and rockets across the area here, right? So if you it's think a of, spot. yeah, where, where's the highest concentration going to be of the enemy? It's going to be right, right the there. And that's where these guys are going to be. So he actually, uh, he's in good Vietnam a good amount of time. As a platoon leader, they're going to be protecting these bases. They're going to be dealing with these rocket incursions that are going to coming over. And their goal is to stop infiltration from the north to the south. So the guys that aren't going around the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the guys that are just sinking straight south through into Vietnam or into South Vietnam, that's where these Marines are going to be. And that, their job is basically to destroy the enemy. Did they have sappers and stuff then too? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah this is... 
now we're in, now we're in uh, 1966, 1967. This is getting to be the height of the war. 67, 68, 69 are the peak years of the war. Yeah. So this is going to be right in the thick of it. You're going to have, you're going to be dealing with, again, if you have your bases, you're going to have sappers. You're going to have guys trying to infiltrate, trying to blow up your ammo dumps, trying to just kill, cause destruction and maim. You're going to have the villages out uh, that you're trying to protect. The enemy's going to be slaughtering the villagers that are assisting you. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's just, it's... The worst of Vietnam is going to be in this area because this is the highest concentration. Whereas further south, you might just have the Viet Cong and the Irregulars. Up here, you're going to have the Vietnamese regular army, the NVA or the PA Vienna. What was the difference called. between the Viet Cong and... The Viet Cong is, is, in theory, it's the peasants, basically, that are just kind of revolting. They're, okay. they're the, the local guerrilla style, whereas the, they're not going to be uniformed soldiers, essentially. Right, so, they could be anybody. Right, just, you know, the neighborhood guys that are picking up guns. Obviously, that wasn't true, and that's not how it was, but that was kind of the idea. Okay. The NVA, the North Vietnamese Army, they're going to be much more well-supplied. So if you get attacked by the NVA, you're going to have rockets and artillery and potentially even tanks in certain areas. There's only, that was very rare, but it, it could happen. Yeah. You know, so it's going to be a lot more organized army. And it's, um, they have fixed positions. They know where you're at. They know where they're at. So they're going to be dealing with that. In March, uh, March through April of 1967, the Marines are going to take part in what's called Operation Prairie 3. So there was an Operation Prairie 1 and an Operation Prairie 2. And these were heavy patrols near the DMZ to basically block any troops coming across the border. On February 27th, 1967, the Marines fired artillery into north of the uh, DMZ in Operation High Rise trying to attack the North Vietnamese on the other side. And the Vietnamese responded by mortar rockets and artillery fire, and they're hitting Conthine and these other areas, these fixed Marine fortifications. So they're firing back. And then there's going to be sporadic firing for about two weeks. In March 24th of 1967, the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, encountered an enemy battalion in a bunker complex southeast of their position. They had a two-hour firefight until the enemy withdrew, leaving behind 33 killed in action, and one Marine was ordered, uh, awarded the Medal of Honor for, for those actions. 33 of ours? 33 of our guys, or 33 of their guys were killed um, th that were left behind, because a lot of times the enemy doesn't leave their dead behind. You know, they're going yeah. to, dr I'm sorry, uh, they're going to take them with them, so it's hard to get an accurate body count, even though we place too much emphasis on that in yeah. the war, but that's kind of the, one of the things. You might shoot someone, and you know you killed them, but they're gone, or they're going down in the tunnel. So it's, it's very difficult to fight a war that way. Um, continuing sporadic fighting. On 30, Mar 30 March, I'm sorry, March 30th, 67, the 3rd Battalion, 9th Marines were establishing a night ambush when they were attacked, and this is where John, John's actions uh, ended up taking place. So just a little bit prior to that, March 27th, 3rd Battalion was tasked with finding and engaging two battalions of NBA, NVA who were known to be operating in the area. So these guys, again, their mission... There's two battalions of the enemy. There's hundreds of enemy soldiers, and your job is to go look for them. Battalions 100? Ab about that, Roughly. a little bit over that, yeah. But so you're going to have hundreds of enemy soldiers, and you as a young lieutenant, he's about 24 years old, you have to lead your guys that you're responsible for to go find the enemy. So think about the, you know, the weight of that command, because yeah. you know people are going to die. You're directly trying to engage the enemy, and a you fixed have to enemy. try to keep them alive. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of what they're going to be dealing with. John was the executive officer of Weapons Platoon at this time, an India company, and they're going to be airlifted into the area, and then they're going to be on their, their search and destroy mission, right? So again, he's 24 years old. At this time, he'd been in Vietnam about 10 months. So at about 1,800 hours or 6 o'clock, 6 p.m., their unit's going to be, India company is going to be establishing a night position, and they're just a few miles from the North Vietnamese border. So the whole of the enemy is wow. on the other side, potentially. You never know. Scary spot to be. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's pitch black. You never know when the, when the enemy is going to decide to come on to south and force. And they, I mean, know the, they know the terrain. They know the terrain. They're watching you. They have scouts. They have spies. They have people out there. Um, they, do, they end up splitting up. So half of the unit's going to stay and set up fixed fortifications, uh, set up dig in for the night, and then they're going to send a couple platoons out for an ambush. How many, pl how many are in a platoon? Uh, platoon's about 30 or so, okay. guys. It depends. 30 to 50, sometimes less. It just depends on, on the unit size, if it's a weapons platoon or whatever it's going to so be. So they send them out looking for enemy? So they're going to send a couple platoons out looking for enemy. Go set up your ambushes, and then you guys will kind of come back here. So the guys that are staying behind, they're going to be digging in, right? Anytime you stop, you're going to start digging holes in case you get attacked. You're going to start digging sandbags. And there's going to be a little bit of a routine nature to it. You do that every time you stop, right? Before the sun comes up, you're going to pick up and you're going to move. You're going to go somewhere else and you're going to dig in. So you never really know how it's going to be. But your body's aching, you're tired, you're sweaty, you're hungry. So all you're thinking about is, let me dig this hole as quick as I can so I can get in and get some sleep before yeah. I have to move again. 
where I can get in and, and I can try to get my And each person has their food. own little hole? Usually there's going to be a two-man to a right. hole. It's, it kind of depends on the setup or the situation that you guys have. Depends on the terrain. Depends on a lot of things. But in this case, as they're digging, the night's calm. They're getting ready to bed down. The calm's going to be broken by mortars. So the enemy knows they're there. So these mortars are going to start falling. And if, if you've never, most people probably haven't, but if you haven't experienced a mortar, a mortar's terrifying. It's loud. It actually sounds worse than it is. But these mortars are going to be coming from the fire, sky, and these are indirect weapons. So you can't see anybody shooting these, right? If they're close enough, you can hear the thump. But the only thing you're going to hear is that whine and that explosion. And then there's going to be a loud blast. Exactly. And then boom, and the guys are going to be screaming. The guys are going to be far, uh, you know, falling. Just the waiting for the thing to hit. Right. And these can have, depending on the size of the mortar, it can be a 20-meter blast radius or a 60-meter blast radius Damn. where everybody in there is going to be wounded or potentially killed, right? So you're digging in. You're going to probably start digging faster, but mortars are used to get your head down too, right? So that means the enemy is going to be moving forward. So as these guys put down their shovels and grab their rifles and brace for an attack, the NVA is going to start sneaking through, and the NVA is going to start... Um, firing at them and start moving forward. So you have your choice to pick your head up and get shot by the enemy. Um, I'm sorry, uh, pick your head mortar. up, potentially get hit by the mortar or, put, or hit your head down and the enemy's going to have a chance to get run up on you. Run up on you. One of the guys that was in the battle said, we had a lot of battles and, he, and Bobo always made the right call at the right time. That day we were outnumbered and outgunned. So these guys that are here are basically trapped. You're surrounded. You have no idea how many enemy are. You don't know where your friendly troops are either. So those guys that are on patrol coming back, you don't want to shoot your own guys. So you're, you're watching and you're having to take well-aimed shots, but you can't see anything because they have this tall, what's called elephant grass, right? So it's, you know, knee-high grass and the enemy's just crawling through it. So you're not seeing anything except for the muzzle flashes that are firing through the night. So these troops are going to get pinned down while this, they're taking this frontal attack by the enemy, while they're taking this mortars, and they're taking significant casualties. So not only are you terrified, but your, your numbers are, are getting smaller and your friends are dying. And you want to go help them, but if you run out, you're going to be exposed and you might get hit and you might make things worse. And there goes the leadership. Exactly. The patrols that are out on the perimeter are trying to get back, but they get cut off by the enemy as well. So now you have two separate elements that are getting cut up, basically. The Marine captain ends up calling for artillery fire, which is kind of our secret weapon and our godsend. So these guys in the back, like Sammy yeah. Davis, are going to be firing on these positions where they know it is, because we already called in those positions. We know where they are. So this artillery is successful, and it's able to drive the enemy back. So everybody's kind of licking their wounds. You're looking around. You're trying to see who's alive. Am I alive? Is my friend alive? You know, where's these positions? And you're scared, man. Exactly. Now, now you're this indomitable force that like, just got dinged up pretty good you're, you're not like, the predator anymore human. you're the prey right yeah, yeah and you're you're kind of trying to suck it in yeah. okay now we don't have a whole unit we don't have a whole platoon or we don't have a whole half a company to defend this area let's try to redistribute ammo let's figure out what's going on let's try to get our enemy or i'm sorry our wounded medevac and as they're doing this the enemy attacks again but this time larger so that that first time was uh, they were basically feeling them out so the enemy will do that sometimes They'll fight you small to see what you react with, see where your troops are, see what everything is. It's kind of a feint. Yeah. So that's what that is. So they come back again, and this time the enemy is going to be supported by heavy automatic weapons and 60, meter, 60 millimeter mortars. So now these mortars are going off everywhere. The, your ears are ringing, the ground's shaking, the dirt's flying all over you, people are and screaming. You don't know if one's going to land on your head. Exactly. And there's no, that's the thing about mortars. You can't be skilled. It's not like, you it's know, the luck of the if draw. I use proper cover, I can block myself. It's literally, if that, if that num mortar's got your number on it, you're just going to go done. down. So it's, it's a terrifying thought. And now they're also using these uh, heavy automatic weapons. So now the machine guns are firing through the night. Jeez. So if you pop up, those tracers are going to rip you apart, right? So you're trying to keep your head down, and you're just curl you know, curling up for dear life, but you have to fight. If you don't fight, the enemy's going to overrun you. And I, they'll I, just run up on your hole, right? Yeah, exactly. And then you're going to be in a real bad situation. And if the enemy intermingles with you, we can't call for artillery fire anymore because they're not going to kill your own guys yeah. and wipe out the whole position. So you have to fight. You have to keep the distance, huh? Exactly. So everybody's getting down. Everybody's trying to do their best to fight, but there's chaos. And this is when Bobo is going to take charge because Bobo is a lieutenant and he has this obligation to lead. So while everybody wants to get down and everybody wants to hug that dirt and do what they can, Bobo immediately stands up and he starts running around and he starts organizing his troops, right? So rather than staying put and yelling where he's at, he knows that these guys need to see him and they need to be given command because they're fighting as individuals. So he's running from hole to hole and he's moving from position to position and he's encouraging the Marines. He's telling them where to fire. He's telling them, keep your head up. We got this. Stay calm. The enemy's to your front. Like, fire, fire. Organizing guys, keeping these guys going. The Marines are badly outnumbered, but he's keeping them calm and he's giving them that leadership. Yeah. And they're also seeing, again... You feel like if you pick your head up, you're going to die. But you're seeing Bobo, and he's running from position to position. 
Everyone's terrified, but he's giving them courage. Just right? that little having a leader that has exactly. that tenacity. You're like, okay, cool. And, he, and this is your lieutenant, and yeah. he's 24 years old. But like we said before on the show, calm breeds calm, right? Yeah. And one man with courage makes a majority. So yeah. he's able to get these guys their head back in the fight. So now instead of a disorganized, terrified enemy, they're acting or um, a disorganized, terrified unit. They're acting like Marines. They're yeah. firing. They're doing what As they're supposed unit. to. Exactly. And they ended up estimating this was about 220 Marines that were being ambushed by about 800 of the enemy. But because of Bobo's leadership, they're able to fight and they're able to hold them back. So the, every, every Marine's doing their job now. They're, they're firing with discipline. They're not just emptying their magazines. They're not running scared. They're firing with discipline. Bobo's moving around. He's seeing where the weak spots are and he's plugging them. So anytime someone goes down, he's going to take that position. He's going to fire forward. He's going to go drag bodies and get them over there and tell them to get back in the fight. Yeah. He sees a Marine with a rocket, and a rocket's a force multiplier, right? We need those rockets. He sees the Marine with the rocket go down. So he runs forward through enemy fire. He runs across the open ground. He picks up the rocket. He brings it back to our troops, organizes a rocket team, gives it to them, and tells them where to fire, right? Because he can't stay in fire with the rocket because he's got to lead. Officers are there to lead, not yeah. to fight necessarily. He continues to fight. About three hours into the battle, the enemy starts to pull back and they pick up their mortar attack again. So they're getting, they're getting picked apart because our Marines are fighting so hard because yeah. guys like Bobo are leading them. So they pick up their mortar attack and they decide we're going to bring it to them this way. So they've been fighting for hours, right, without respite. About three hours they've been fighting. You've been seeing guys die. You've been, you know, it's getting Jeez. picked off. That chaotic mortar fire, again, the ground's just shaking. You're terrified. It's guys are more probably, toward the middle of the night now. Oh, yeah. Guys are probably pissing themselves, essentially, right? Yeah. The, the enemy starts coming back during, these, uh, during this lull that the Marines are, are putting their heads down because of the mortars, so the enemy starts coming back forward. So John sees this, this force of enemy troops coming, so he charges directly for, towards them, right? To be an inspiration to the guys and to try to do as much damage as he can to the enemy, he picks up his rifle and he charges forward. As he's charging and he's closing the distance with the enemy, as he's firing his rifle and he's trying to kill them, a mortar, blo a mortar round blows directly next to him, and it throws him up into the air. When he looks down... His right leg has been severed completely below the knee. It rips, his, rips the entirety of his leg off below the knee. Jeez. Imagine the catastrophic amputation. Imagine in the civilian world if something like that happens, right? Yeah. He's literally running one minute, ready to fight the enemy, and now his leg is blown off below the knee. His legs, you know, he's pumping blood. This is a severe wound. You can clearly die from this. He's got a grievous wound, but he's still a leader. He knows that despite his leg, he needs to lead these guys and he needs to inspire these guys. And he also knows that it's going to be difficult for him to fall back. Bobo doesn't cower, he doesn't retreat, and he doesn't panic. He knows his wounds are going to prevent him from making it to safety. And he also knows that he's going to be burdensome to everybody else. A corpsman reaches him and a corpsman starts to give him morphine and try to drag him back. And John fights him off and he says, leave me alone. Leave me alone. Just put a tourniquet on my leg and give me my shotgun. So the medic's yelling or the corpsman's yelling, get, you need to get out of here. You need to get out of here. And John's yelling, shut up and give me my shotgun. So with the help of the, uh, the me uh, corpsman, sorry, they take a pistol belt and they tie it around his leg and they make a makeshift tourniquet. And John orders him to help him prop him up against the tree. So despite Holy trying shit. to take care of his wounds, he's got this loose tourniquet on. But if you know anything about tourniquets, they have to be yeah. very tight. And this isn't. So he's still bleeding profusely. So he takes the stump of his leg and he shoves it down into the mud. He shoves it into the dirt to try to flow off the, um, uh, the blood that's coming out of him. And he orders the corpsman, give me as many shotgun rounds as you have. Give me all the shotgun rounds you have and tell everybody else to fall back. So now John's sitting there. John's wounded, John's leg is blown off, literally, and he's shoving his stump into the ground to stop the bleeding, and he's loading his shotgun. And the corpsman's pleading for him, come back to the rear, fall back, fall back, our guys are falling back. And John says, just tie off my leg now and give me all the shotgun you have, then you've got to help me get to the ridge. So he helps him move to a forward position, and then he orders his men to retreat. So all the Marines are falling back to a safer position, and the only thing that's protecting them is John and his basically surrounded by these shotgun shells that he's going to use, right? The enemy continues to move forward. The enemy has the Marines on the run, right? Again, as we've talked about, if you show your back during a firefight, if you start to retreat, the enemy has the opportunity. The enemy can shoot you in the back. If everybody turns and runs, no one's defending you. But these guys are able to fall back because John's out there by himself with that shotgun. Damn. One of the Marine uh, corporals that was with him, that's what he said. It was just him all by himself, and John starts to fire with this makeshift tourniquet with his leg jammed into the ground, he starts putting devastating fire on the enemy while yelling. He's screaming at the top of his lungs, pull back, everybody pull back. The first sergeant runs to help. 
he's, as he's moving through the open area, the first sergeant gets shot by an enemy soldier, and he goes down. An enemy runs up on top of him to finish him off, and John blows him away with the shotgun. So the first sergeant said, he killed the NVA soldier who had wounded me in the leg and was standing over me. And he went on to say, I saw him kill at least five Vietnamese soldiers, although he had been seriously wounded. So this first sergeant is watching, right? This first sergeant goes down, and then he looks up, and he sees an enemy soldier, and he's about to die. And then he sees the guy take, you know, 932 caliber rounds of a buckshot in his chest as he oh, goes over. Shit. And he looks up, and John's fighting. John's not scared. John's not cowering. John's not thinking about himself. John's pumping that action on the shotgun and firing. He's putting devastating fire on the enemy. And a shotgun's a devastating weapon in this close-range yeah, fire, yeah. especially in this sporadic fire. So he's loading as fast as he can. He's pumping as fast as he can, and he's putting the enemy down. So not only is he there, but he's putting devastating fire on the enemy. They're not able to advance forward because every time they move forward, John's cutting them down with the shotgun. And if you take a shotgun blast, whether it's a buck or a slug oh, of that 12-gauge shotgun, you're not getting up. No. So he's putting these guys out of ammunition. Again, there's a lull, and he reloads, and he's yelling, everybody get back, get back. And uh, the first sergeant said, he kept the enemy from outflanking my squad, and he saved our lives. So these enemy are trying to turn. They're trying to get around to the Marines that are falling back. And John's just putting this devastating fire on him. The only thing that's out in front is a guy with one leg completely blown off below the knee and a shotgun. Still right? in the fight. Loading as fast as he can, putting down fire as fast as he can. The Marines are able to get to a safe position, and the platoon commander ordered the corpsman to go get to Bobo. As soon as the corpsman gets there, John again yells back at him. He says, get out of here and leave me alone. He was alone fighting a horde of charging enemy. There was grenades exploding all around him because now the enemy knows they needed to dislodge him, right? Yeah. The Marine Corps unit is here, the enemy's here, and John's in the middle alone. John's firing that shotgun, so they have to get rid of him. So they're firing at him with their rifles. They're trying to pop up, but every time they pop up, he's putting them down. So they're trying to fire indirect weapons. They're throwing grenades. Grenades are blowing up. There's shrapnel hitting him. There's, you know, the terror of the night. The mortars are still going, but John's firing. Steel kneeling. Shotgun blazing when the enemy opened up with a machine gun, and the, end, the machine gun ripped him across the chest, and his shotgun finally fell silent as John fell to the ground dead. So despite the fact that he had been wounded, he was able to hold this ground. And when they found his body, he had been riddled with gunshot wounds. But by his valiant spirit and his heroic efforts, he inspired the rest of these guys, and they were able to fight off of the enemy. His last stand enabled a group to get to this protective position where they repulsed the onslaught for the rest of the night, and they were able to survive that night. Damn. One of the guys that was with him said, no one ever said a bad thing about John. He was decisive in his decisions, and he never hesitated. And that was the perfect yeah, example of that, right? <laughs> decisive in his decisions. It was time to go, and he went. At the end of the firefight, there were 16 Marines, in, uh, in addition to John, who were killed, and there was 47 wounded, to give you some idea of the intensity Jesus. of the firefight. But if John hadn't made his last stand, there would have been a lot more dead. Hell yeah. Right? So again, a 24-year-old lieutenant, so anyone who ever talks about lieutenants not being worth a shit or lieutenants being lost or lieutenants being there for, for, for promotion. In the middle of this firefight, his wounds were so grievous that no one would have faulted him for going back, Yeah, right? No one would have faulted him for retreating. And, and it would almost be the smart thing to do, to yeah. take cover. But John grabbed a shotgun, which isn't the fastest weapon. No, alone, man. And John started putting the enemy down. And again, this first sergeant is laying there on his back, wounded, looking up, getting ready to face his mortality, and then boom, that shotgun, boom, that shotgun. You look boom, up, you see shotgun. a one-legged guy right. just busting A one-legged guy putting it to him. And you can imagine the enemy as well, right? Yeah. Looking and seeing what's going on here, and it's just this one guy. And again, in the darkness and the chaos of the night, all you're seeing is these muzzle flash. If you ever fired a shotgun at night, you're going to see yeah. that muzzle flash. It's going to be nice and loud. So it's, and it's a terrifying weapon. And... Oh, yeah. Scream at his guys to get back. So again... For his actions, we wouldn't be talking about this if it wasn't, uh, John Bobo was awarded the Medal of Honor. Obviously, that was posthumously. So well-deserved. Well-deserved. Jesus. Um, on August 27, 1968, at the Marine Corps barracks in Washington, D.C., the Secretary of the Navy presented the Medal of Honor to John's family. And like you said, well-deserved, man. Um, that kind of embodies what the what the You couldn't make about. it up. So this is one of those where if you showed me a movie and you had a guy get his leg blown off and you had him yelling, get back, leave me and alone, and give me the show. Yeah, yeah, it sounds crazy. I, trying to tie that tourniquet on, again, I do some tech medicine instruction and That'd stuff. That'd be brutal, right? Yeah, it, well, a tourniquet hurts, but this he's using a pistol belt. You're not going to get a proper tourniquet with a pistol belt. You might There's no way to tighten it, right? There's no way. Yeah, you might slow the bleeding around a little bit, but you're not cutting off that artery. So then he shoves it into the dirt as hard as he can. And it sounds like common sense. Of course you're going to put it into the dirt. No, you're probably going to lift it up and try to keep the pain, but he's shoving that nub, that severed limb. I was going to say, limb. it's going to be brut brutal pain. Your, your bone is shattered, right? Yeah. Your bone marrow is sticking out. Your muscles, your ligaments, 
everything is there. And it he's wasn't a clean shoving it into the dirt. No. Oh no, yeah, this is razor pieces of metal yeah. just cleaving it off. He's shoving it into the dirt so it'll slow it down so he can stay alive longer. Not right? to live, right? To fight L- without treatment, bit he's gonna die. But he wants to stay alive long enough to load that shotgun to get one more round off to get one more round off. And getting his leg blown off didn't kill him, right? The the grenades didn't kill him. The small arms fire didn't kill him. That machine gun is finally what ripped him across, yeah. right? And because all these guys are having to focus their concentration of their fire on Bobo, that's allowing these away. other guys to get it back, to retreat, and then to fight forward. Inspired and then by what they back. saw. Oh, absolutely. And you want to get to him, right? If you see your buddy out there, or even if you didn't like him, maybe he yelled at you because he was your lieutenant or you something, see but some now you like see that? him, yeah, you're going to try to get All to him. All of a sudden, you're like, all right, dude, yeah. you're for real. And that's, that's what officers are supposed to be. They're supposed to put themselves before their men. They're supposed to be, you're supposed to be the last one to eat, the last one to go to sleep, the first one to be awake, and all those things. Yeah. It doesn't always happen that way. But John Bobo was the first one out of his foxhole, the first one moving from guy to guy, the first one giving those commands, the first one running into the open area to get that rocket launcher, the first guy, well, almost he wasn't built for it. Because again, when he was a kid, he was too small for the football team. So he tried to make himself get better. He made himself what he needed to be. I'm just saying mentally, man. Yeah, mentally. When you get your leg blown off and your first, I mean, like you said, (laughs) your first instinct would be like, yeah, get me out of here. You know, no one would say a word about that. I bet you there's, there's a million warriors out there that even other, maybe even other Medal of Honor recipients that wouldn't have shoved their leg into the ground no. after getting it blown off. You know what I mean? Your instinct it, wouldn't be to fight at that point. It takes point. a special kind. Yeah, you know that's, what I mean? that's a fair, I'm out of the fight at yeah. that point. That is a fair, okay, I did my best. Yeah. I, you know, get me to the rear or I'm going to die. Yeah. But his only thought was... I mean, that was, was badass in itself, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Moving you go from home guy without guy. a leg. Exactly. Moving from guy to guy, inspiring that, inspiring that um, unit to fight, keeping your guys and organized. You know, that's a medal right there. Yeah. Before the fact... And again, just, just holding that shotgun and just firing. And if, if you guys, again, I wish I, I had a video. I'll, I'll find one of the shotgun. Just firing. Boom, boom, boom. It's a slow fire weapon. If you think of video games, you yeah. know, you're not going to, when the zombies are on top of you, you're not going to be wanting those because it's slow. He firing a weapon. If you're using the sights, you know, it's, it's fairly easy, so it's good. But imagine the devastating effect that has on the enemy oh, when they're seeing that and they're going forward. And again, a, a Winchester buckshot, it's, it's nine pellets at 32 caliber rounds. So those are good size rounds. And yeah. you've got that spread depending on, you know, the it's size of the It's going to tear somebody choking. up. Oh, it's going to tear them up. You're not getting up from that. Yeah. You're not getting up from a shotgun blast, whether it's a buck or a slug, the way you would get up from potentially a rifle or a pistol round. So he's, he's devastating these guys. Yeah. And, it, and if there's any foliage in between, if there's any in jungle in between, he's devastating these guys. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a super, super powerful weapon and it's a Man. super powerful symbol for these guys. So I'm going to go ahead and read his citation yeah, here. Okay. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of life above and beyond the call of duty, as weapons platoon commander, Company I, 3rd Battalion, 9th Marines, 3rd Mar- Marine Division in Quang Tri Province, Republic of Vietnam. On 30 March 1967, Company I was establishing night po- ambush positions when the command group was attacked by a reinforced North Vietnamese company supported by heavy automatic weapons and mortar fire. Lieutenant Bobo immediately organized a hasty hasty defense and moved from position to position, encouraging outnumbered Marines despite the murderous enemy fire. Recovering a rocket launcher from among the friendly casualties, he organized a new launcher team and directed its fire to the enemy machine gun position. When an exploding mortar round severed Lieutenant Bobo's right leg below the knee, he refused to be evacuated and assisted on being placed in a firing position to cover the movement of the command group to a better location. With a web belt around his leg serving as a tourniquet, and with his leg jammed into the dirt to curtail the bleeding, he remained in this position and delivered devastating fire into the ranks of the enemy, attempting to overrun the Marines. Lieutenant Bobo was mortally wounded while firing his weapon into the main point of the enemy attack, but his valiant spirit inspired the enemy, I'm correction, inspired his men to heroic efforts and his tenacious stand enabled the command group to to gain a protective position where it repulsed the enemy onslaught. Lieutenant Bobo's superb leadership, dauntless courage, and bold initiative reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and the United States Naval Service. He gallantly gave his life for his country. (sighs) To say the least, man. How's there not posters of these guys? 
You know this, what I mean? This is one of those. It's there funny. should be posters of them, like their enlistment photo or right. something. Yeah, and then like should a, be a household a name. Brief almost. synopsis of what happened. If you did, not again, a cool artistic action style rendering of it, though, like it would be too much. Right. A guy with one leg firing like that, you know? Well, the fact that it's real is even, like, you know what I mean? Right. I don't and know why they don't. multiple they've witnesses. Never, they've never found a way to market these guys, like, not to market them, but, no, I you know, know what you're like saying. to yeah. bring it to the youth. Like, these right. stories are inspiring as hell. Yeah, it's. We talk about will to survive. Yeah, this is this is the epitome of will to survive. Last week's er, episode with the pilots. I mean, how is right. that not like a? <laughs> that's brotherhood and body. Yes, right? I but mean that's, that's. I mean that's what we're trying to do here. For these is, kind of is times, man, these you want to. These kind of stories are awesome. And and again, moving from person to person, standing up in the middle of a firefight and running from person to person, organizing, being that calm in the chaos, you know he's terrified. Yeah. The only difference between him and the other guys that are terrified is he's telling himself, "You got to go forward. You got to lead these guys. These yeah. guys need you." He's 24 years old. He's not an old man. Yeah. He doesn't have a I just I still picture a 40 something year old dude. Right. With a big gruff, rough dude. Yeah. And this I'll already po- lived his life and shit. Come on. Yeah. I'll post pictures of him. I mean, he's in decent he's shape, but he's not a big buff guy or anything yeah. like that. But he knows. And to say, oh, you know, moving from position to position, that's what a leader's supposed to do. It is what a leader's supposed to do. That is what a lieutenant's supposed to do. He volunteered, you know, by nature of becoming an officer to do that. So this is a kind of person that steps up and says, I'm willing to take that responsibility. Yeah. And they're still doing it today. You know, the, every, every officer in the Army today made that decision. I'm going to be that leader. Yeah. I'm going to do what I can. People have a tendency to think of military people as stupid, which the, nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah. But you got guys like him. Again, one of you read, he's a history major. I say, of course he's a history major. You know, you can imagine him as a kid just reading these books and reading these stories of these ancient Roman heroes and, yeah. you know, these Spartan warriors or, or, or the Zulus or whatever it may be and thinking, that's, that's powerful. That's what I want to be. That's what these kind of guys do, right? When I was in the Army... The Army was the only time in my life, if I was in a group of over 10 guys, that I could start talking about the Peloponnesian Wars and somebody would know what I was talking about. Really? Right? Yeah, there's always going to be at least one person there. And I was an infantryman. People are, oh, you're infantry, stupid. There, there's some guys that are lower ASVAB scores over there, but you have all kinds of guys that are doing it because they're trying to emulate their heroes that they've grown yeah. up reading about. So there's about, a lot you know? of people like you that... Yeah, like we talked about last episode with Joey Ross, my buddy, yeah. or a, a couple episodes ago when he recommended. He, we would sit and have long historical conversations. When I was in basic training, when you're shining your boots in between, guys would be you know, yeah. arguing about history and politics and things like that. And don't get me wrong, you definitely have your guys Knuckle that, draggers. that can barely write a sentence. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, they're necessary, too. They're though. absolutely necessary, and they're the salt of the earth. They're great people. But you had guys that all they wanted to do was be an infantryman and be in combat because they've read about it their whole life. Because so do you they, think there's something poetic about, like, if you told Bobo that hit this story, this is what happened, yeah. he'd, he'd have a grin if, on if, his face? If there's, a, if there's another world and he's ever somewhere or anywhere looking back on this, I think he'd be very proud and very yeah. satisfied. <laughs> yeah. And I think, again, he had the decision to stay in his foxhole before he died. He had the decision to go to the rear. He had the decision to plead for his life and try to get cover, but he did not do any. He didn't take any of those outs that he had. So I guarantee you, whatever he met on the other side, right, <laughs> he met with a smile he, on a his grin. face. Well, he met with a gritted, gritted teeth and a shotgun blast, but once once he yeah. passed over to the other side, I yeah, always this think would about be... that too, like if, if they were on the other side mm-hmm. and there's a way to look back and are they holding their head up a yeah. little higher? Like what a yeah. what a warrior's death, right? Yeah, that's, that's your entry to Valhalla. You yeah. see a lot of that nowadays. <laughs> yeah, oh, so my ticket to Valhalla. It's like, dude, you're not a warrior. These yeah. guys are freaking warriors. Yeah, These, this is this is fighting to the end, right? When he died and facing death with exactly. a freaking smile on your face, like right. let's go. When he died, he probably got hit with so many machine gun bullets. He he never knew what hit him. Yeah. So the last thing he saw was looking Victory. down the side of a shotgun. Yeah, and holding these guys off and yeah. seeing you know. Knowing that you guys are getting somewhere to the rear, what can be more satisfying than that? You yeah. Know, what can be more satisfying than protecting your brothers? What can be more satisfying than than giving your life? And why do you think these stories are so like soul fulfilling to hear? Do you because think there's it's like the, a DNA it's, thing? It's 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 the embodiment of humanity. You know, war is the worst thing that can happen to society. War is horrible. Every warrior knows that. But like you said, that guy could have been a dick to some. Like right. there could be guys in his troop that hated him. Right. But even they see that and go. Right. Damn. It's it's pure. This is this is what everything's about. There's no about. bullshit there's, on the battlefield. There's no bullshit. That's a good way to put it. That's to be assured. There's no bullshit on the battlefield. It doesn't matter what you think of each other. Everything's exposed. If you go, if you could 
you know, go and witness all these wars and go back through time and just find a battlefield in Korea and watch it, you're going to see guys that hate each other dragging each other through enemy fire. You're going to yeah. see guys that love each other dying for each other. You're going to be see guys that would never talk to each other in civilian life, you know, that, yeah. are, that are giving their lives for each other or sharing their last piece of bread or whatever that may be or sleeping together in a sleeping bag to try to warm each other or up. Picking fleas off like Tybor. Yeah, you know? Exactly. Like, you can't fake, yeah, Tybor Rubin, yeah. you know, cleaning people's shit off of them. Yeah. Guys that are covered in their diarrhea that are, are unable to care for themselves and he's he's wetting their uh, you know their bodies whereas and getting in, that off you're of back them. in country you would be like Ew. yeah but in battle it's kind of like i got you right you know if, I mean? if you if someone if some random stranger took a bite of your sandwich in a diner you're gonna flip out and call the cops or yeah something, yeah you know but if you're on a frozen side of korea you're gonna give your last piece of food yeah if you're in vietnam you're gonna get on that tree and you're gonna fire that shotgun and another thing about it is is you can't plan for that i mean you can train to be a soldier but you can't train you don't to have know that until warrior's you're there heart. no one's gonna know what you have it's and no like one's going to know dude. who that guy's going to you know, be. Yeah, everybody talks tough and stuff until you can't train hard. You're surrounded by 20 guys and exactly. your buddy's running or he's standing there with you and taking exactly. it. Yeah, man. There's something like about these stories that I always wonder like why does that feel good to hear? Why does it go everybody goes damn. Yeah. There's not one person that's like, "Oh, come on." Right. You know what I mean? Everyone's just like, "Damn, that would be super cool." <laughs> If that's the way you went, that would be badass if that was the way you went. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. It's so funny how that resonates across cultures, mm-hmm. countries, that's, ethnicities. That's true. You know what I mean? That's, that's humanity. What, what, is, what greater example of love than to give your life for something? Yeah. It's greater love to have no man than that he gives life for something. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I'm giving away all I have and all I'm ever going to have. Yep. Nothing else in the world. If, if I die, I'm dead. You yep. know, regardless of what you believe, you, everything you have is gone, and I'm giving that gift to you by nature of me firing with my shotgun. Ultimate sacrifice. The right? ultimate sacrifice. And it's, it's, it, you feel that welling of pride. Like, like I said, when I'm researching these or when I hear, first hear these stories, I, you know, I'm on the verge of tears half the yeah. time. I'll have to put books down because it's just moving. There's nothing yeah. more powerful than that. And, and John Bobo is the perfect representation I of bet that. you the battlefields, like you said, are just full of moments like that that are just goosebumps. For the person yeah. that lived it, witnessing this stuff happen, it's probably just like, the holy fir- The first sergeant shit. on his back, getting ready to meet his maker, looking up and seeing an enemy, and then and seeing then him get blown boom. away, probably covered with his, bla- you know, his yeah. blood, and then and not just boom, and not like a cool action movie, yeah. boom, and then boom, and then boom, and then boom, because he's firing, and he's putting that yeah. fire down on just everybody going, else. Damn. Yep. Feeling like this big compared to him. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? You're watching a hero. Yeah. You're watching a hero. You're watching a dude that just has something that, that most people don't. Yeah. That's pretty sweet. They need to be posters of these guys. Let's let's make it happen, man. Yeah. Make, some, make some art, Donnie. We You're should. We should do yeah. some posters of these guys. There man. we go. That yeah. would be bitching. Just like nasty black and white <laughs> enlistment photos. You know what I mean? Right. And then they their little caption. Yep. That's good stuff, man. Good one. All right. So All that's right. the story of John Bobo, Vietnam. We had a request on one of the comments for Ronald Rosser, so yeah. we're going to do Ronald Rosser next uh, next episode. Who, and then, uh, who requested that? Uh, one of the commenters. I, okay. I don't remember the name. They just said that was one of their favorites. So, okay, we'll um, shout them out next week. Yeah, any, any other uh, suggestions you guys have? Otherwise, I'll put up another Instagram poll, and we'll go from there. But All right. Thanks for listening. Thanks. We'll see you next week. Two weeks. Yeah. Next time. Yeah.